and Minister Patricia Venus Henry. Join me every Sunday right here on the Tobago Inspirational Network at 9.30 p.m. for Stepping on the High Waters. Stay tuned because God is turning things around for us in this season. Now, there's another thing I notice about verse 1 of Genesis chapter 22. Uh, Abraham's response immediately was, here I am. Now, Abraham was visited by God before. Abraham, uh, you know, had, had, he had visitations and interactions with the angel of the Lord. Uh, not only did he speak to the angel of the Lord in, I believe it's chapter 18, one of my favorite scriptures in Genesis chapter 18, one of my favorite passages of scripture uh, in the Bible. Uh, he broke bread with the angel of the Lord. He got a fatted calf. He said, Sarah, go get, go get some, let's, let's, let's go, go put some stuff in the oven or whatever oven they had at that time. Go bake some bread and, and let's kill a fatted lamb. Let's sit down and eat. That was God. The angel of the Lord was God's presence with him. So he knows what it is to, to commune. I was thinking about communion, but that's a, that's an inside joke for the family. Uh, but he knows what it is to commune with God. So he knew God's voice. So the moment God says, Abraham, and it was exclamation mark Abraham, not, you know, Abraham, A-B, he, he wasn't calling him gently, it was exclamation mark, Abraham. Abraham was like, yes, here I am. So let's read verse 2. <clears throat> then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrificing him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Didn't Abraham have two sons? Abraham had two sons. Didn't he? He, he, he messed around with Hagar, got, got her pregnant, got a child called Ishmael, and here is God telling him, um, you only have one son. Take your son, your only son, whom you love. When we go to Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 to, 11, 8, 8 to 13, let's read this really quickly. The, ch the, ch the child grew and was weaned. And the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham had a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son of Hagar, Ishmael, the Egyptian, uh, had born uh, to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son. For that woman's son will never share in inheritance with my son Isaac. Remember I told you about the messiness? The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Your slave woman. Uh, listen to whatever Sarah tells you. Because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also because he's also your offspring. So we see the messiness we talk about in Bible study. Uh, Abraham sent Ishmael away into the wilderness, he and uh, his mother Hagar. So there was only one son living at home. The one son who they, that God told them was going to come, the one son that he was living with. And just in case, when God said, sacrifice your son, just in case Abraham became wise and said, you know what, let me go and find Ishmael, yes? So once God found Ishmael from me because God told me to sacrifice a son. God was like, sacrifice, no, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. So obviously when God says the only son, obviously God recognized Isaac as the son of promise, which is why he said that. But just in case Abraham became smart because we are human beings and we're smart because if God told me and he didn't call the name, I was going to say, hey, somebody find Ishmael from me there. Please. So we must also talk about the significance of a burnt offering. So verse 2 tells us, go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. <clears throat> so the purpose of a burnt offering, uh, if you look at, if you go to, you don't, you don't have to go, I'm just saying, if you go to Leviticus chapter 1, Leviticus chapter 1, uh, where God gave Moses the ceremonial laws, uh, 
Leviticus chapter 1, the entire chapter, describes what a burnt offering is. A burnt offering is, is intended to be an offering that is an atoning offering. So, on a yearly basis, the children of Israel will go to sacrifice, and all of the sins for the year, they will, you know, depending on how much money you have, you need a, a, you know, submit a dove or a pigeon or whatever, or you could have calves or, you know, oxes, whatever, depending on your uh, amount. And the instruction was the sacrifice, which was an animal, uh, should not have any blemish. And maybe that gives us the insight as to why God chose Isaac to sacrifice. Because, obviously, Ishmael was full of issues. Uh, and, you know, Ishmael being the result of disobedience and rebellion, trying to sacrifice Ishmael when God told you to sacrifice your son, probably is not a good idea. Now, in the process of conducting a burnt offering, you have to lay your hand on the head of the animal or the sacrifice and pass on your sins before slaughtering the animal. The animal must be slaughtered, then put on the fire. So you're not just burning up an animal. You're slaughtering, the, you're passing on your sins. That animal will be the, the representation of your sins, the corruption that you, that you are now cleansed for. And then you slaughter the animal, and then you put it on the fire. Now my question is, what did the Lord want Abraham to atone for? Because that's what a burnt offering is supposed to be. I don't have that answer, but it's a question I ask. Because we already established that the intentionality of the request made by God was to tempt Abraham. You just wanted to tempt him. You wanted to see, are you going to follow through with what I gave you to do? And we'll leave it just as that. Verse 3. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. There was no hesitation from Abraham to follow God's instructions. There was no evidence in the passage that Abraham questioned God nor gave him a reason. We just read in 21 when Sarah was like, hey, I don't like that child, and I don't like how Hagar and that child mocking my child during this feast. Get rid of her. Get rid of them. And Abraham was distressed. He was distressed because he considered Ishmael his son. How now, one chapter later, God is asking him to, to take the son of his promise and says, sacrifice your son. Next morning, he gets up, loads up a donkey and says, let's go and chop some wood. No hesitation. No question. Now, I don't know, and the scripture doesn't tell us, what time of day God spoke to him the day before. Some, some Bible scholars, you know, like you have to read through a lot and sift through what people say. Some Bible scholars say it was a vision in the night. I was like, well, if it's a vision, how could he answer? You know, but anyway, <clears throat> it wasn't a dream because he answered. Anyway, uh, some say it was a vision, but I don't know. When God spoke to Abraham the day before, all I know is the next morning, early, he got up. What was that conversation with Sarah like? Because for him, for him, he had two sons. But for her, that was her only son. Did she even know that Abraham had, that God spoke to Abraham? I mean, if I had to bet... If I had to bet, because remember Abraham was from Mesopotamia, you know? They had a little melanin in their skin in Mesopotamia. Come on, they didn't come from the Caucasus. Come on, work with me here, guys. You know? Anybody with a little bit of melanin, just a little bit, they don't have a lot. A little bit of melanin, especially your mother would be like, who, which child? Because she already showed him sass. She's like, I don't like her, get rid of her. I don't like her, that child, get rid of that child. And make Abraham send his own child into the wilderness. So imagine... Him telling her, hey, God tell me to sacrifice Isaac. Not happening. Not happening. But anyway, there was no hesitation on his behalf. I 
I also want to mention something that, you know, he woke up in the morning, whatever he had to deal with, even in a conversation with Isaac, he woke up, sat on the road to, to, to go to this place, to get the wood and then go to this place. I have to make special mention here that probably one of the reasons why Abraham followed God's voice so acutely was, remember he was accused of falling short before the whole Ishmael saga. So he was like, you know what? I know God's voice. I know when God speaks. And many of us, we could testify to that. We've made mistakes before. I've had said things like, oh gosh, I regret not doing, you know, God said to do X. And if I had to do X, now I would have been a millionaire. Or if I had to do Y, I would have owned the house by now. Or I would have had this sort of, you know, if I had to listen to God and not listen to my friends, that would have been my husband right now. That would have been my wife right now. And I let people interfere with what God had to say. I let my mind interfere with what God had to say. And now you're living a life of regret. So he told himself, I am not going to ignore God's voice this time. Because he had experience. And that could be a contributing factor to Abraham's quick action. Verse 4. On the third day, so they were walking for three days, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we'll come back to you. Verse 6. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. And the two of them went on together. Okay, something's not computing. I'm confused about a, a, a few things that went on here. First of all, Abraham asked the servants to stay back. Isn't the point of servants to serve? When you're a rich man, there are certain things you're not doing. They walk three days, assuming it was flat land. They get to the place of the mountain. And when you get to the mountain is when you shed the servants and the donkey. So that will make no sense to me, first of all. Why would he tell him to stay back? <clears throat> and then offload the donkey, offload the servants, and put all the wood on Isaac to carry. Because he says that Isaac carried the wood. Why did he need a donkey? Obviously, the donkey is a beast of burden. Anyone? Work with me here. Yes? He loaded the donkey. He didn't say he rode the donkey. The scripture says he loaded the donkey. It means he put all the wood on the donkey back. What the donkey couldn't carry, the two servants were carrying. And he says, you know what, Ollie, stay here. Give me all of the wood and put it on Isaac's back. All he carried was the fire and the knife. You remember, Abraham was over 100 years. We don't know how much over as yet. But we know that Isaac was old enough to carry his own wood. So he wasn't a boy. If he carried, the, the, the amount of weight he carried was equivalent to what the donkey and the two servants carried. He wasn't a little boy. He was a big, strong, strapping man. That means that Abraham was even older because he was 100 years when Isaac was born. Now, secondly, so that's the first thing. Another point on that is, obviously, he understands he don't want no extra distractions. When you have more people in a situation... It's distraction. I remember when I was going to propose to Apostle Leah. I was like, how am I going to do it? How am I going to do it? All I, I didn't know, I didn't figure it out as yet, but all I knew is I don't want anybody else involved. It's going to be me and her. Because when you involve people, that's how, yeah. you know, that's how things just get messed up. I was like, ah, I don't want people involved. It's going to be me and her. We go, I'll figure it out myself. And I did, thank God, because we're still married. And we're doing well. But Abraham was like, I do not need any other person who might have, who might not have the amount of faith that I have to be where we are going to be because maybe they might try to distract me from doing God's bidding. And sometimes we have to leave people behind who can't handle the vision that God has given to you. Sometimes you have to leave without telling some people because they can't handle what the Lord spoke to you about. And that's the thing, you know, we, we, we speak about it so much uh, that when God gives you a promise, sometimes you have to hold on to that promise close to your chest. And the next time that person sees you is when the promise is already bearing fruit. Because people will kill your dream, kill your vision. 
they will steal your ideas. They will steal your thoughts. They will steal your processes. And then take it for them. Or exactly to slow you down because obviously, you know, when we grew up, as I said, when, when, when we were growing up, we were in competition all our lives. From, from elementary school to high school. That's why grades are so important. And who has the best grade point average? And who come this one at the end of the semester? You go to college. Competition. You want to be, you get the best grades, best year. Then all of a sudden, we go to work and relax. We go to work and we expect that all of a sudden, everybody's just going to be your friend. You know? Let's go out for dinner. And, you know, I have co-workers who all go to each other's houses and stuff. It's like, the devil's a liar. We're in competition. We're in competition. Nah, you can't come to my house. No barbecue for you. I, I used to do that stuff. I used to do it. You know, I went, I remember the first job I ever had. I used to go by my boss's house and holy man, baby, and thing. Go and play golf. I can't play no golf in, but go and play golf with them, man, all kind of stuff. They still fired me. They still fired me. And I was bitter and angry for two years. You know what I'm telling you? For two years, I was bitter and I was angry until God was like, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And I, had to, I wrote a book about dealing with that bitterness. Now, I didn't deal with the book. Help me get over the bitterness. I still feel I have to write a book to talk about the bitterness. Because I was, listen, I was, if I see you in the road, I'm going to accelerate. That's how angry I was. I would accelerate. And then after I accelerate, put it in reverse and hump over again. That's how angry I was. Now, all I could laugh and pretend you never got that angry in life that you want to bong somebody down because of how they, they, they treated you. That's okay. God delivered me from it and I could talk freely. I was mad. But God. Because if I had really see them, I might have a situation. But that's a different story. So here comes Abraham. Puts the wood on the boy. <clears throat> he removes the distractions, the two servants. And then what happens? Why did he say that he would, we will worship? Back in, yeah, verse 5. Put back verse 5. Why would he say we will worship when we come back and we will come back to you? You remember what we said? Obedience is worship. When I obey God's word, I'm actually worshiping God. And whether Abraham intended it or not, what he was doing was actually showing God worship and saying, Lord, Lord, you gave me this instruction. You gave me this command. It's a hard command to follow. It's a hard command to walk through. And some of us, we know, how, we know ourselves. If God says, hey, do X, Sister Elizabeth. It's easy. I could do that. That easy. All God, all God wants for me to do is cook a plate and send them some food. All God wants me to do is give a man $100. Come on, God. Of course, I love you. God, I love you. What if God says, hey, take your deed to your house? And sang it over to somebody else. I'd be like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, Jesus Christo, Yahweh, Yahshua. Hold on, <coughs> hold on, hold on. This doesn't compute. Now it sounds funny, but sometimes, remember Abraham already went through his levels of faith. You know, this was the ultimate test. And God is like, the one thing that you needed to rely on me on that you couldn't fix for yourself, even when you asked Hagar to step in, you still couldn't give yourself what I could promise you. The one thing God promised you, whatever that thing is for you, can you give that up? God says, when you obey, you worship me. And remember when we, we use John 14, 15, you don't have to turn to it. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. If you want to show God love, you're going to obey. You want to impress you want to impress God. You want to do what the Lord says because you believe that there are rewards on the other side of doing that. When a boss asks you to do something, you will do it and you try to do it to the best of your ability because you believe when you consistently do what they are, you're told to do that there are rewards on the other side. And they are. Now lastly, in that passage, verse 4 to 6, things that kind of stood out, we said he left the servants behind. He let Isaac carry the wood that a donkey and two people were carrying. He didn't want distractions. Uh, why did he say he will worship? Because obedience is worship. Whether he intended it or not, he was telling them, hey, I'm going to go to the point of my obedience. You guys stay behind. Obedience is worship. But then lastly, 
uh, from that section. Scholars don't have an exact age of Isaac, but I mentioned to you, if he was strong enough to carry a load of wood enough for a sacrifice. See, remember what I said a burnt offering is? You have to put the carcass of the animal or the sacrifice on the wood. So it can be a bag of sticks. And if he said he got a donkey, that means there's enough load to carry for two men and a donkey. He put on Isaac back. Isaac was no little boy. Isaac was a big, strong, strapping man to be able to carry that weight. And intend for him to carry it up the mountain. He's not, he's not dragging it in the plain, you know, just dragging it along the grass. He's carrying it up a hill, up a mountain. So we know, at a minimum, Isaac was big enough to understand what's going on. Verse 7. Isaac spoke up. Now he's saying, hey, I'm carrying this wood. The servant's gone behind. We're going up a mountain. You just say we're going to worship. Isaac said, uh, spoke up and said to his father, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire is here. The wood is here, Isaac said. But where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. By Abraham's answer, did he expect God to stop him before killing Isaac? Did he really believe that the Lord will provide a lamb? Maybe, maybe not. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, NIV gives us a clue. So Hebrews 11 is the hall of faith. Remember that, script, that's, that um, uh, chapter that starts off, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And through it, you see, by faith, Abraham did. And by faith, Noah did. And by faith, uh, uh, Rahab did. They mentioned Rahab in the Hall of Faith. So this is the Hall of Faith chapter. And here comes verse 11 that says, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the death. So Abraham was like, listen, I know this is my son. I know this is a son of promise. I know this is everything that I ever wanted God or asked God for. But I believe God so much that even if he doesn't provide a lamb, he's going to raise my son from the dead. And you see, many of us are waiting to act in obedience to God because we want to see the lamb already available. We want to see it. God says, I'm going to bless you with a, a business. Or I'm going to bless you with a house. And it's like, well, Lord, I need to get the money first. Or I need to get the qualifications first. But when God speaks, he makes avenues available for us to do. But we have to obey God's word and we don't have to see everything prepared for us before we act. That might be too late. So here comes Abraham telling his son to calm him down. Abraham probably was nervous as, as, as ever. He was nervous as ever. And he's like, you know, son, yes, my son. Oh, God will provide a lamb. And this time he's like saying, Robo soko, Lord, provide a lamb, provide something. And Sometimes, as I said, we wait for God to provide everything before we take an action. And Abraham was of the reserve. Well, hey, if God provides, glory to God. If he don't provide, well, Lord, you better raise my son from the dead. And many times you have to say, Lord, I believe that you will heal me. If you don't heal me, if you heal me, I give you glory. If you don't heal me, well, you better raise me from the dead. When the Hebrew boys were in the, in the fiery furnace in uh, the book of Daniel. King Nebuchadnezzar, with all his men and them, they, they, they start to play the, the instruments, the satrap and the cymbals and stuff. And they were like, well, you need to bow to the statue. You know what they said? King, we're not bowing. And he says, I'm not bowing because I know that my God will save me. But even if God doesn't save me, I'm still not bowing. In other words, our 
ability to obey God's word is not contingent on whether or not God will deliver, you know. It's conditioned to our heart. And there's something that happens when you follow God's word irrespective of how you feel. Irrespective of what the situation looks like. Irrespective of how dark and how gray the skies become while you are going through your situation. If you purpose in your heart to obey God's word, whether the result, the favorable result happens or not, it moves God to the miraculous. Every time you go in the Bible, every single time, fiery furnace. They went in, they didn't get burned. God defied nature. God defied science to give the Hebrew boys their salvation. He didn't stop the fire from happening. He didn't change the king's heart. He said, go through the fire. Hot enough to burn the ropes. But yet their clothes were unsinged. Forget their clothes. Their hair was unsinged. Because they, again, from the region they were, there were some hairy little boys. And them boys, they hair. You don't have to be in the fire to get your hair singed. You ever reach to the back burner of your stove to stir it? And then it smells like, what's that? When I look, all kind of brown curliness on my hand. Your hair singed, you're not even in the fire. Noah obeys God. Could Noah whistle and cause all these animals to come? You might get your dog to come when they whistle. But you ain't getting no bear to come. You ain't getting no lion to come. They can't whistle it. There's no bear whistle. To call a lion and a bear and a dove and a snake and a giraffe and a rhino and all these different animals that the Lord used. So the miraculous takes place in our life when irrespective of what the answer would be, we still decide to obey God. We must come to a point where we will obey God, we will follow his word, we will worship him, we will give him thanks, we will give him praise, irrespective of if he changes the situation or not. And there are times when we pray long enough. Listen to me. I've been praying to God for some things, and I'm like, listen, I get tired. I, I, God is not deaf. So how much time is you going to pray to God for the same thing over and over and over and over again? And God is like, hey, I invented the air. I invented the eardrum. I could hear you. Stop praying about the stuff. Worship me. Give me thanks. And you must get to a point where you no longer care about the result. It sounds weird as a human being to not care about the result. But I'm talking about you're not so tied up with the result that they keep digging and digging and digging itself into a bigger hole. It's like those gamblers. You go to the casino. I've been to a, a casino or two. And they tell yourself, I'll take $20. I'll go in and ring. To say, when that is done, be done. I got the experience and I move on. You know, there are some people, they put it, they say, I'm only spending 500 today, boy. I'm only spending 500. Take out 500. Nothing. They take another 500. Nothing. Now, the mistake some people make is when they take out 500 and they make a 750. It's like, ah, ha, 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 I'm doubling everything back in. And it's a vicious cycle. I must get the result. I must. Get the result and it dig itself in a deeper and a deeper and a deeper and a deeper hole. That is like praying to God for an answer that is not yet coming. God knows your heart. He knows your situation. He sees you where you are. The this, this scripture says he is touched by the feeling of our infirmities. He knows what it is. He sent Jesus. He knows what it is to be sick. He knows what it is to have sin. He knows what it is to be dealing with those circumstances. So we must get in a position, and the reason why we could worship God in the midst of our troubles is, if he fixes it, to God be the glory. If he doesn't fix it, he is still God. And God is like, I'm waiting for you to get to that disposition. The moment you don't care about the result and you will serve me just for serving me sake, here comes the miraculous. And you might be saying, oh, oh, Apostle uh, uh, Dion, you, 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 are you saying that there's a formula to activate the miraculous? Yes. Yes, don't be tied to the result. Because many times God will deliver it, sometimes in a different form than they're looking for. I'm Minister Patricia Venus Henry. Join me every Sunday right here on the Tobago Inspirational Network at 9.30 p.m. for Stepping on the High Waters. Stay tuned because God is turning things around for us in this season.